Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Carly Bird. And I'm Thomas Aarons. What week are we on, Carly? We're on week 49. Week 49. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This we- is our 49th podcast episode. I cannot believe. Yeah. I mean, I know we wanted to try to do two episodes this week, a bonus episode, and then also a regular episode, but then, of course, time with everything else. And then also just honestly, the commitment of, you know, fishing the DMV, things like that. It, it it's just been Tom awful. has been teasing this episode for it, it's been rough. I know, I know. This is like the episode that I've been really he waiting just keeps for. Talking about it, he's like, So, there's this episode. What I'm gonna do is sharks, and we're gonna talk about sharks. And then, whenever he's just chilling on the couch in the living room or on the floor with the dog, or whatever, I'll just hear these people screaming and look down at his phone. And he's just watching a shark like mutilate a human being, and I'll just be like, Why are you watching that? I love how and you're he's hi- like, Sharks. So first, I love like you make me sound like I have Down syndrome. Thank you. And I'm your husband. I really appreciate that. And then second, I really like how you're like just setting this up for failure by just putting these expectations I'm so not, high. I'm not setting like, uh... up any expectations. <laughs> I'm just saying that you have been talking about this. I have. I, I have been talking about this. I think it's fair to say you've been looking forward to this episode. I, I have been looking forward to this episode. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to get some research done because I, I, I might even break up this break this thing up into two parts, honestly, because, you know, I'm actually going to take this off right now. Pop. There we go. Cool. Actually, I'm not going to It's called it. viewer rate retention, Tom. I know what it's called. You got to talk about it. You got to hype it up. You got to people keep people engaged involved in the conversation so they actually want to hear the story so they don't get bored with hearing the monotonous you know everyday moments of our lives be like oh we're just stick stick it out for the story well people might want it's really good you know honestly people might actually want to know like what's going on in our lives carly what's going on highly doubt it highly doubt it why do you say that because people are as interested in what's happening in other people's lives as they are with as they are with their own lives so that is true but my god why are you so pessimistic you sound like house from like that medical dr- like drama or that one asian chick from Grey's anatomy just like you need a cigarette in your hand being like you know life is death life is pain meredith gray yeah 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 you literally need a cigarette right now being like you got off a 15 hour shift and like seven <laughs> people died under your watch and you're just like the human race should just just drop uh, I've never said anything like that. Yeah, I mean, you kind of hinted at it. Like people in the chat, is she being a little bit too uh, depressing tonight? Let, let, let me kind of know there. Um, I, I think we have a really cool episode. So I'm not going to lie. This is, I think this is a really cool episode. It's, it's, it's something that I really think is fascinating. Um, before we get into the meat of this, because I'm going to go on a bunch of tangents, I do have a story that I whipped together that's kind of a little bit different than what I was initially going to do. And like I said, if this, depending on how this episode does, I know it's not spirits and ghost story ask, but honestly, this is a platform I, I can actually talk about this. I think it's pretty cool. So anyway, before we get into that, Carly, what are we drinking tonight? Tonight, Tom, we are drinking the sweetest white wine I have ever tasted in my life. Do you happen to remember the name of the brand? Because I don't. So the way you all can prepare. You see what I'm saying? Like she's just like hate evening. fucking this night. It's like you know the brand? No, I don't. So fuck it. So drink this shit. He's not gonna remember the name of the brand, <laughs> do you? Uh, Tears of Gettysburg. No, I don't think that's for what a split called. second. She was like, "That is very precise." I wonder what it is. I feel like it's wrong. Anyway, this wine is the sweetest wine I have ever heard in my ever heard i'm reading a comment right now that's why i'm doing this i have ever tasted in my entire life all right therefore to get yourselves in the mood just go out to your local liquor store and pick up the sweetest white wine available and then you'll you'll know when you taste it it'll be like whoo make your lips pucker hey come back to me what are you doing I am just keep talking. I'm trying to fix it on your phone as well. Oh, Tom's trying to fix something on my phone right now. Oh, I think the audio is decent. Does that comment come through? Yes. Hey, yo. All right. So, so comments are working. Audio is working. <laughs> we are good to. So, Carol Ann's just the only one that's not here. That's crazy. Wow. Well, it's because she's busy. Oh, she's busy? She starts school in like a day or so. Oh, I thought you texted her. I did. Oh, she didn't respond? She never responded. Because I texted her at like 8 
Fair enough, fair enough, because I wanted to like have a good little retort. So I have no it's one to talk to. Kind of late for people who get up at five o'clock in the morning. All right, I'm shocked same. our other viewers here. I know, right? Okay, so now the new segment of the day is Carly says something positive. Carly, can you say something positive? This weekend's weather's supposed to be really nice. That's amazing. Like upper seventies, lower eighties. Really excited. That's fantastic. See, and this was Carly's optimism for the day. All right, we'll put welcome that to Farmer Co Farmer Carly's. You say Farmer Cock. <laughs> Farmer Carly's time of day. I don't know. I don't know. I'm so tired. Yeah, she's complaining, and she got to sleep in. So, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Who got up first? Raise your hand. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Who, when he got out of bed today, the dog was mad at him because he's like, "Why are you up?" It's me. Yeah. Then he started to cuddle you more. Well, if it makes you feel any better, the dog missed you immensely today. He was mean? a depressed, stressed mess. Maybe it's because you because didn't you look. weren't home. I walked him for a solid hour this morning. Okay. Well, Every single time I went on my break, I went downstairs, and he was like on edge. Like, what are we doing? Where are we going? Awesome. Well, Where's that makes, Tom? That makes me feel worse. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, on that cheery note, would you like to get into the story today, or you got something else more pessimistic to talk about? Let's talk about it. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's hear the story. I'm so excited. So you said you have a story and you have some shark attacks you want to talk it's been about. It's brought to you by Eeyore. Eeyore. Uh, please talk to your pharmacy about depression. Depression is real. It probably won't rain at all. All right. Let's do this thing. There we go. So tonight's episode. Some of my wine. Carly, what do you know about sharks? I know that they can get real big and that there are a couple different kinds of them. And I also know. Hold on. Let's see how many shark uh, breeds I can I can name. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Just hold on. Hold on a second. Like while you're thinking your thoughts, I know. Be depressed. Uh, chat. Everyone down there. I know we got about six people watching. How many sharks are actually dangerous to humans? So we're gonna do a little game here. The winner, message me. I'm gonna give you a gift card to Sheets. Sheets, because that's how we do it in Hagerstown. I didn't tell you how much, but you'll get a gift card to Sheets. And if you're a gaming person, congratulations. You'll get like a dollar more because you have to spend even more in gas to get to the competitions, and I feel you for that. But name in the comments below how many shark species are dangerous to man. Now, here's the kicker here. If you can name them in a row, or at least the big three, I'm going to give you bonus points. If you can name the fourth that's also extremely dangerous to people, then you automatically win if you can name all four that I'm looking for. But through that, there's I'm going to give you... four that you're looking for? There are for? four big ones. There's the big three, and then, then there's like a... I don't know, a teaser. Can I guess right now? You can guess right now, too. You can guess right now. I was gonna hopefully going to give chat a second because maybe they'd actually want to win some money. My bad. Okay. I'll but wait. what do you know about sharks? Well, I know that uh, there are some small sharks that people call baby sharks, but actually the breed itself <laughs> is sharks. small. Okay. I know that some sharks are one specific kind. I believe the great white can be, get as large as like a like like a like a whale, mm -hmm. right? They can get up to like, I don't know, 20 feet or so, a whale, because they had that, um, what's it called? That movie about the big great white shark. The Megalodon? Yes, the Megalodon. Who's the who's the character that was in that? Channing Tatum? No, Channing Tatum was not in that. It was the other bald guy. <laughs> um, what's the his bald name? guy. What is his name? It's a Megalodon. Vin, no, not Vin Diesel. Mm -mm. Uh, Jason Statham. Jason Statham. That's right. Statham. It's the Megalodon. Anyway, so that movie was completely surrounding sharks. I actually thought that movie was going to be better than it was, but it wasn't. There's was more I actually kind of enjoyed you. it. I really did. It was good. It was I thought, it was, fun. I thought, it, was I thought it was really good. All right. So we got one person here in the chat. Let's take a look, see at her. And I love how she just sprays and prays every single shark that she knows. Uh, let's see, what we got here Linda Aaron's a great white shark, the tiger shark. We got the hammerhead. We got the black tip reef shark, the blue shark, the lemon shark. Stop it. Uh, what? That's so many sharks. That is so many sharks. Now you're missing two. Hold on, you... hold on, hold on, hold on. The tiger shark. What? Okay, uh, I need four. Okay, the tiger, the great white, the hammerhead, and. You're missing the... one that causes more fatalities than all of them. Bull shark. Yes, the bull shark. The hey! bull shark is missing from that list. I did zero so, research for this episode. if you can name them in order. 
Thank you, Linda. So, so far, <laughs> Linda's going to win the prize unless somebody can name them in order. And, <laughs> and if somebody can give me my my spoiler, my dark horse, that is actually one of the most deadliest sharks in the world that no one talks about. Uh, it's really hard to guess. It's really, really hard to guess. But so far, Linda looks like she's winning a $20 gift card to I Sheets. You can win a $20 gift card to Sheets if you can name them actually in order. But so far, it looks like Linda is winning the first. In order of what? Alphabetical order? No, the what are you talking about? Which shark is responsible for the most attacks on people? The most deaths. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And then the dark horse shark, the sleeper shark, the one mm -hmm. that no one actually talks about that actually is really responsible for some of the worst stuff like the U.S. Indianapolis. Is really responsible. The way you set that whole comment up, it makes it sound like that shark's the one that makes his bed in the morning. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just like, saying. He's the most responsible. He brushes his teeth twice a day. JK. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we, got, we got somebody here. <gasps> oh, Joy. Hi, Joy. Long time no see. Bull. Bull. Correct. Yep. Bull is number one. Bull has the most fatalities on humans. And then we have, there's two more that my mother actually said. You have within my mom's thing, you have the great white, you have the hammerhead, you have the lemon shark, you have the passive aggressive shark, you have the tiger <laughs> shark. I just wanted to name that to see if anyone <laughs> throw that up there because it'd be hilarious. <laughs> just say like, is it the bull, the passive, it's and then the great white? <laughs> uh, but no, there's two more actually on there. Hello. Hi. I don't. Okay. <laughs> that took me out of it for a second. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Check your live stream. Yeah. I, what do you mean? Check your live stream. I don't know. Your mom just said check it, but apparently people can hear it because that's all right, Joy. I understood what you meant. Fantastic. No, I think everyone actually can hear us. Okay. So that's, that's really good. Um, no, it's good. Fantastic. Cool. All right. So are we ready to get into this? So yeah, absolutely. We're ready to get into it. So basically the order is you have the bull shark, you have the, you have the tiger shark, and then you have the great white for the most attacks on people. Tiger, great white. Okay. What about the hammerhead? Where does he come into play? He does not come into play. Ever? Mm -hmm. Is he the docile shark? Is golden retriever shark? Uh, he can be. He can be deadly again. He there is about I think ten record shark attacks that actually have to do with a hammerhead. The thing is, the great hammerhead can, can get over twenty feet long, and their main fin, their pectoral fin, can get to be about six feet long. Where's a pectoral? Their main fin on the back. On the back. Yeah. Six feet long. And so when you see that thing cutting through the water, it makes you absolutely terrified. Yeah. That sounds like way too long of a, it's, a pectoral fin. Well, we're going to, yeah, we're going to Google her Did right here. Pectoral or fictoral? What was the word it, again? I will. That's part of the whole thing I'm going to do tonight. We're going to get into all that. Okay. Pecs are like boobies. Okay. So anyway, the top three most dangerous sharks that actually, uh, deal with human beings is the great white. Of oh, course, shit. we said the bull shark and the tiger shark. The dorsal fin. Yes, I literally said the dorsal fin. So, anyway. You said something else. Huh? I'm sorry. You said the Good. pectoral fin. I do. Like the boob fin. Like, why would the shark be <laughs> oh, swinging no, upside I down? Thought that's what you said. Anyway, the three most deadliest sharks to humans are the bull, the tiger, and the great white. And that's what normally people think of. Yes. But there is also a fourth, which is actually the oceanic white tip. The oceanic white tip. It's very hard to find. It, you don't really see it in contact with people because it's an oceanic scavenger. It's also called a pelagic species. Pelagic is a word for an open water creature, whether it's a tuna or a shark, um, some whales. I guess you could consider pelagic, but pelagic usually has to do with fish. It's usually, you know, right. the category can't breathe of it. oxygen. It, it, anyway. Fish. A, anyway, whales can. That hurts. Whales can. Huh? Whales, whales can't breathe underwater. You are correct, but pelagic Anyway, so oh, it has, it has to do with to do oceanic that. gas. Got it. Okay. They're scavengers, but they're also probably responsible for a lot of predations on humans and shipwrecks, crash victims, things like that. Anyway, those are the four sharks I was looking for the thing, but whitetail, yep, whitetail are very dangerous too. Oh, wow. Everybody forgot about the whitetail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the white, the whitetail uh, deer is very dangerous to. Uh, According to Carol Ann, they breathe through gills. What the hell are you guys talking about? I feel like you're having another conversation here. The fish. Do I, yes, they do. Yeah. Well, well, obviously whales don't. They have a little blowhole. Hold on. I need some more wine before we get into this whole thing. Deer. <laughs> what is happening, Joy? Why are you saying deer? I have no idea what's going on. Anyway. So, okay. So now that we got into it. We got the wine. We got all that stuff done. Guys, I just want to preface this by saying this. I do love sharks. I think they're really cool creatures. This is not a combination of the shark species or anything like that. It's not hating on it. I'm just trying to breathe a little light into it. 
my brother and I have spent a ton of time on the ocean, a ton of time in the bay. We used to go to Florida all the time. We have seen sharks all the time. I have immense respect for them. Too much. Okay. Maybe it, enough. Maybe, maybe, maybe the right enough. enough. But what I'm saying is like, it's a healthy respect. And I heard this really cool thing from this. Um, he, we are talking about sharks and you said deer. Anyway, so... I'm not gonna look at the chat anymore. I'll let you look yep, at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You stop. Just stick with what you're talking stay about. Stay focused on the on, on the show. Focus, Tom. So anyway, there was this really um, Steve Irwin said this really cool quote. And I was listening to his biography I about like, Steve. yep, Steve Irwin was really cool. I was listening to his autobiography the other day. This guy was doing a really cool job with it when I was running. I was listening to it. And he said this really cool thing about we just need we need to respect alpha predators, but we don't have to make excuses for them. Mm. And I really love that the way he said it, because ideas like you want to respect them, but you don't have to make excuses for them. So I just want to lay out some data, lay out some things that are very interesting, but then also hopefully bring this to light and maybe we'll have some healthy debate and then tell you about some attacks that have happened that I don't think were mistaken identity. Um, that is one thing that's been out there for a very long time that really got promoted with shark week and things like that, that everything is always like mistaken identity. Well, in the world, there's a handful of creatures that live that when we are in their environment, we are no longer on top of the food chain. Okay. Tigers, lions, crocodiles, and sharks. Those are four creatures that many zoologists, if you ask them that, those are ones where if they, if you're in the wild with them, they look at you not necessarily as always as a threat, but can I actually predate on you? Okay. We all think of tigers and lions, of course. Yes. Bears are kind of a 50-50 mix with grizzlies, but tigers and lions specifically will look at you as, can I, I would not have said you? crocodiles. Um, this also gets back to a great movie that was actually done in the 1980s, which is called Into the Shadows um, or, or, or Ghosts. And what's really cool about that is it talks about two lions that were actually feeding on people that were building a railroad in Africa, which was very interesting. Uh, and we might actually get to, into that at some point in the future. Hippos can be very aggressive. I don't know that they try to eat people, though. No, and hippos actually cause more fatalities than crocodiles. Right, but I don't think they eat people. That's Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's more like they're fending their territory. They're just yeah, very it's territorial. more of an aggressive thing. But 100% yeah. hippos actually do kill more people than anything else. I'm talking about creatures that specifically, if they had the chance, they would look at you as a food source. So example, like the Nile crocodile. Mm -hmm there's an issue with those in certain parts of Africa where they stake out watering holes where people actually go to actually try to get water. Mm -hmm. The salt crocodile in Australia, the one that Steve Irwin tried to protect the most, another issue there where it will, it will start looking as people as a food source, not always, but sometimes, but anywhere, anyway, we are kind of, uh, yeah, ghost in the dark. Thank you. Yeah. It's a fantastic movie, by the way. It's really cool. Um, but now we're going to talk about the sharks. Okay. Why do you think sharks, out of all the things that I have talked about, cause the most fear? Because they come out of nowhere. You can't see them. You're close. It's because we are so uncomfortable in the water. Ah. It's the one thing we haven't tamed. Did you know we know more about Mars and the moon than we do about our oceans? No. We've explored more of Mars than we have our oceans. Think about that for a minute. Think about how far away Mars is. Yeah. Think about how hard it was to go to the moon. And yet we don't know anything about our oceans because human beings. Because it's so deep. You can't get down there. Homo sapiens are terrible in the water. We're shit. Yeah. And we are so uncomfortable and so unnatural in the water, which is which is one reason that brings it to when you're in the water, you feel like you cannot defend yourself at all. Because mm -hmm. you're faced with maybe like a lion, a big cat, a, a crocodile or something like that when you're actually on land. You still feel like this weird you sense can get that away you can control. at some point. Absolutely. But you feel like in the water, there's no escaping yes. it. So with that, compared with what you said was the unknown. Mm -hmm. And then you have these things called the movies like Jaws. Jaws comes out and it absolutely completely changes the way people look at sharks. It literally did create a culture of killing. There was a huge, huge buzz about killing these great animals. Um, you could actually go out to places exactly like New York, Delaware. Chesapeake Bay, Ocean City, and you could actually go out there with shark kills. And they actually used guns a lot of times where they take and they'd actually shoot the sharks and throw them back over. Jeez, so Absolutely terrible. But then what actually happened is you saw an uptick in conservation. Ah. And then in the 1980s, I think it was like 19, I think it was like 1989, 1990, right around there, Shark Week started. And you had this massive conservation effort to actually help 
increase the shark population. Then the great white shark was actually put on the endangered species list and was actually protected. From then, their numbers had slowly increased. And that kind of gets us into basically today, we're going to talk about stats and then we're going to kind of get into our story here because I think there's a lot of missed rumors about this and I want to break it down that, yeah, sharks, you might not actually get attacked and die, but it depends on where you are and how you can actually adjust the statistics. Okay. That's what's very important here. So if you've ever, if you ever watched Shark Week, and I think everybody here has, because it's actually the longest running special program in history, <laughs> Discovery. It's as old as I am, I believe. I think it's like about 30 years old. That's so funny. Which is insane. This last year, they actually had The Rock, part of it too, actually hosted. So think about how much money they actually have to have to do this thing. It's a fantastic programming. I, I would feel like it's been really educational to have though. I don't know. Some of the, the shark weeks that I've seen actually, like they do get down to like mm -hmm. factual data about sharks and you learn a lot and it almost helps you respect them more and like fear them a little bit less. Exactly. And that's what the way it started out. It was this idea of, of letting people know about sharks and being able to conserve them because they are a very important part of our ecosystem. But they're still an alpha predator. And I think there's a little bit of misinformation that, that Shark Week is starting to do. Example is you have a higher chance of like getting hit by a coconut. Um, you could get struck by lightning while holding keys. Yeah. And it's the idea that you can manipulate statistics. And so what I mean by that is if I tell you you have a one in a thousand shot one in a thousand shot of actually getting hit by coconut. Okay, cool. That statistic is a little different compared to where you are. If you're in Colorado, your statistical chance is way different than if you are in Florida. Right. On the then planet. your statistical chance is way different if you always work with coconut trees. Yeah. So there's also this issue here where I think you're fudging the numbers a little bit and skewing it to understand that your chances of actually getting hurt by these creatures. And so what ends up happening is people's perception of these animals, I think, gets diluted a little bit. And so I've gone to the beach and gone swimming and actually been in the surf where people will literally kids will be swimming and they're like, hey, I, what do you have to worry about? They won't hurt you. I have no chance of getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And what happens is your your respect for the animal goes. And as Steve Rowan says, respect them. Just don't make excuses up for them. It's still a predator. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads me into some interesting statistics here. And I thought this would be when people say, like, you have a very, very small chance of actually dying from these amazing creatures. So let me bring some of this stuff up because I think this is kind of I think this is pretty cool. Well, OK, you know, because people died. But I, I think it's interesting. <laughs> I'm going to retract that statement. I think this is pretty interesting. So an example is, but where do you think the most shark attacks are? I'll be set in the ocean. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. Okay, we're back. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The most sharks, Florida. Florida. That's actually correct. You did it. <gasps> yes. I don't Yay. know how you did that. But yeah, so yeah, shark attacks in Florida are actually absolutely the number one place that you're going to get attacked. However, it is the lowest probability of you actually dying. Really? Why? Why? Because of the topography of the ocean and what you're actually dealing with. But that's what's so interesting. So in the United States, for example, if you exclude Hawaii, from 1958 to 2018, we're just going to go based off that data, okay? There have been over 1,006 shark attacks. 1006. Since when? When was the beginning of it? 1958 till 2018. All right. Okay. 37 are fatalities. Oh, wow. So that's not a lot. Mm -mm. So in theory, if you just go off of that statistical anomaly, mm -hmm. you're correct. Oh, Australia was a guess. Australia was a, was a guess. guess. And that actually is number two. <gasps> number Ooh, two. Good guess. But this is what's interesting. Australia, there have been in that same time period, 646 attacks. Okay. 260 fatalities. Ooh. A hundred of them fully consumed. Whoa. Bodies were never found. Africa was number three on the list. Oh, wow. 346 attacks, 94 fatalities. But that is not the kicker here. The kicker here is this little island. This little island is called Reunion Island. And it's actually a French, it's a French island. Um, off Madagascar. It's owned by the French. Top Gear did an episode there and they actually talked about this. Oh, not, I think I remember this. That they episode. weren't allowed to go into the water. Yes. They only have a measly 38 shark attacks. 
and their whole existence from well, whole existence, but from 1958 to 2018. Okay. Out of those 38 attacks, 19 were fatal. Ooh. Which means that's 50%. Yep. So there, if you get attacked, you have a 50 50 chance of dying. Yeah. And you think like that's no big deal, except when you think of this little tidbit, which is the fact that swimming in a reunion is actually banned. It is illegal by punishment to go into the water at Reunion Island. Oh, wow. And so I just want to whip up this little thing here just to kind of show you this because I thought that was you think that's insane, but it, it's just really because cool. it's so dangerous. That's because it's that dangerous. For you and I it might be the shark attack capital of the world, but travelers who focus on that will miss out on all the things it offers. I love this. I just, I love this article. Like how it's like, listen, you might die if you go in the ocean, but besides that, you know, don't worry, don't worry about it. It's, yeah, it's fine. fine. It's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so anyway, so despite its beauty, the island is infamous for a staggering number of shark attacks in its recent years, gaining the nickname the shark attack capital of the world. Due to this reception, the Union Island government banned swimming and surfing along the coast permitting water activities within lagoons and areas protected by anti-shark nets oh so think about this for a second the shark attacks there are just so bad the literally the government said like we just got to cut this shit out we gotta yep. cut it down so again am i saying sharks are, are absolutely evil ugly killing monsters no what i'm saying is don't be completely retarded and actually just know where you are and what you're dealing with don't be oblivious you're right statistically speaking if you are going into florida if you go into the water you don't have a high chance Okay, period. Yeah. But then if you go into Florida, your chances go up. Yeah. Your chances of dying aren't really bad. Mm -hmm. If you go out at night and you go swimming, your chances still go up higher. Like that's how stats work. And right. so I don't like when you see people swimming out underneath a pier where people are fishing and they're like, well, no, your stats just went up a little bit because you're being stupid. Mm -hmm. Like respect the animal and that it's a predator. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting into that. And then it's also where you swim. So like Australia, Reunion Island, clearly. Yeah. Like, even though there's still a low probability, look at what you're playing with when you gamble there. I know. So, that makes me even like freaked out that I went like um, snorkeling out in Florida in one of the reefs in Key West last year. And so that gets us into one of today's tales. I really wanted to do this really cool story, which was about the U.S. Indianapolis. But I thought the U.S. Indianapolis has been a little bit overdone. Everyone's heard of the U.S. Indianapolis. If you've just seen all, if you've seen Jaws or something like that, you've actually heard of that thing. Mm -hmm. Instead, I wanted to, I wanted to think maybe I was going to do the Jersey Shore attacks in 1916 during World War One, the attacks that really actually did the novel Jaws, believe it or not. Um, but then I was like, that's been too overdone. So I thought we're going to do this. We're going to talk about. One shark attack that I found quite terrifying. And then we're actually going to get to a story. And then we're going to talk about this guy that's probably the luckiest guy or the dumbest guy in the world to end us off, which will be kind of like our shark attack in the news type of thing. Okay. So you ready for this? Yeah. Okay. So let's get the music up here. The boys were out that day. It was sunny. The wind was just slick, calm. The water was pristine. They all took turns on the board. Ryan just got off the board. Sorry, I spoke his name earlier. Ryan just got off the board and was swimming back to the boat. That is when John jumped out. Okay. We've got Ryan, John, and Stuart. Ryan, John, and Stuart. Okay. Okay. Ryan got back on the boat. John jumped off the boat. Okay. Nothing wrong there. But when John jumped off the boat, Stuart was complaining the whole time, like, dude, you took my turn. It was my turn to get on there. All right. So he got back off. The boat got back on. Stuart jumped off the boat. As soon as he hit the water, the water started to boil around him, and the other two boys panicked. When out of nowhere, a 17 foot great white grabbed him by the shoulder and his side and brought him under the water. The two boys panicked and were absolutely just starstricken of what happened to their friend. All of a sudden, he emerged on the other side of the boat, being dragged across the hall while he was screaming. The boys took a paddle, an oar basically, and started to beat on the shark before it submerged underneath the propeller of the boat. The next thing they saw was a boil, and then all of a sudden what they thought was like a dark liquid they figured out was actually blood. And before they knew it, organs started to pop up from the surface. Oh no! Immediately, the boys, in shock, drove the boat straight into the beach 
They didn't dock it. They straight into the beach. And they started running frantically up and down the beach, screaming at everyone to get out of the water. The boys were treated for shock. Meanwhile, of course, you know, the, the Coast Guard came down. And there was a search launched for him. All that was found of him was parts of his lung and his shorts. This was at the time the worst attack in Western Australia. Now, you might be wondering, why the lungs? Well, this is one of the only ways they can actually identify individuals that are actually consumed at sea because the tissues of the lung are actually lighter than the water so and will float. So this individual was actually fully consumed in front of his two friends. And they were actually, one of them was actually institutionalized for a year after this attack happened because he was in such shock. That individual, Ryan, was the one that then drove the boat straight ashore of a beach. That was the tale. That was the first story. And that was actually a real attack. I will actually link in the episode description the full attack so you can actually go look at that for yourselves. Scary. It actually did happen. Um, okay, okay. So she didn't hear. But anyway, so that was the first tale. That I know it's not really a tale. Um, I just felt kind of, I adjust the names. You can see the names when I link it down below. It just felt kind of weird telling it in that eerie way when it's people that actually got eaten and died. <laughs> so when I first was like, I'm going to, I'm going to adjust that a little bit for him. But anyway, yeah, he was uh, fully consumed. They never actually found the body or anything else like that. Um, but yeah, it was so weird. And actually Ryan talked about later on how if he, if Stu didn't complain about it was his turn, which is funny because he was the guy that went to the shop. I know. So it's just so crazy that like, he now really feels like, oh, it should have been him. Mm -hmm. But his friend bitched. And they said, like, it was so funny. Uh, it's not funny, but is it as soon as he touched the water, yeah, like it, ex it exploded. Gotcha. Um, and they said it was so what was so interesting, like how they tell a tale is like it happened in like seconds. Mm -hmm. But for them, it was like it probably felt like hours Yeah, that it hit him on this side of the boat. It went under. He surfaced on this side behind me and then it just drug him across the hall. And they said like they could, they were grabbing at him. They're trying to grab his hand, but the shark was so big and had him such a big grip. They couldn't break free. Just, just like Jaws. And the other boy was actually beating on him with a paddle. And then it just, when it went under, it probably did a head shake. They said the bite radius was really from the peck here all the way down to his gut. And Good so grief. when it, it's over 17 feet. Yeah. He's but massive. the fact is when it went down, and it did a head shake. It just, it gutted him. Yeah, it just severed him. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a very good palate cleanser, I think, to kind of start with. Uh, I don't think that shark thought he was a seal. Um, but I don't think the shark thought about it. Anyway, so. You just thought, mm, That was the first tale. What did you think? That's scary. And that kind of gets us into our, our next one. This one is a, is a little, little bit more... Uh, this one is, is going to be our main tale for the evening. Okay. Um, this is actually based on true events, and we'll get into that into a minute. Okay. This is the story version of actually what happened. Okay. All right. And then we'll actually get into the whole thing. So it's the same story. Same story. Um, I guess you could say like liberties right. were done with it. Okay. Okay. They made a movie out of this. Oh, they did? Yep. A very scary movie after the real events. So, ready? Mm-hmm. Time now for the tale, The Reef. Luke had a really good job. He said it was the best job. Living in Australia, you could say this was really what every boy of his age would want to do. He got to deliver yachts for a living. Mm -hmm. It was really cool that living up in Melbourne, he was able to deliver boats from Melbourne all the way down to Sydney. And honestly, for the pay and to be outside in the sun, it was kind of like a dream job. This time, he decided to bring his friends along, Matt, Kate, and Susan. They would launch from Melbourne, and they would drive it down to Sydney. Well, he's done like a thousand times. It's about a two to three day jot. That night, they set out. No issues at all. They drank. They partied. Matt and Kate were thinking about getting married. It was just one of those fantastic times to be alive, especially that young in their life. Why would you think anything could go wrong? Then that night, out of nowhere, a weird storm hit. And they actually were run aground onto a part of a reef. Mm. 
Australia is known for a lot of their reefs. On the western coast of Australia, there's this thing you might have heard of called the Great Barrier Reef. And the tides there can fluctuate a lot from a high to a low. So instead of like a one foot tide, you're talking about 10. So you can go from standing to not very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, the boat, the yacht ran aground. It must have been a little drinking they did the night before, partying to celebrate that Matt and Kate actually might finally tie the knot. Pesky kids. Whatever happened, it happened. And the yacht was sinking. Mm. They didn't know what to do. They tried to call for help on, on the sat nav. But for some reason, it was just not working that night. As the boat sank into the water, they had to make a gut decision to bail. Oh, no. They decided to bail. But Kate was like, it's so, we can't actually, what are we going to do? Just float out there? Let's stay with the yacht. Luckily, the yacht did flip over and it capsized, but it flipped over onto its belly. So the all Luckily. four people crawled back on and they sat there for a while trying to make a decision about what to do. Matt was like, there is a, there's an island out in the distance. It's got to be no more than 10 miles away. If we swim to it, they have a life, uh, they have a lighthouse there. We'll be able to go there and actually reach for help. Luke was against this idea. No, this dude, we're not going to go try to swim across the open ocean to get to the island. Matt, listen, if we don't, it's low tide right now. That's why we hit the reef. When high tide comes in, we're going to be swept out on a capsized yacht deeper into the ocean being pulled out our options here are to swim or hope something positive happens when we're adrift into the ocean mm -hmm. thinking about their options they all decided it's probably the right idea okay okay well high tide isn't for a while let's we got about three hours let's try to make it that was their options we're stuck really between a rock and a hard place Susie was almost in shock about the horror deal. You want us to swim over five miles in this ocean? But they did it. They got all their, they got their life vests on. They got throw cushions, everything they could as buoyant things. They strapped everything together to make a huge raft and they started on their journey. Two hours into it, no problems. Cracking jokes about what was happening, how they're all going to laugh about this thing. No problems. Kate was apoplectic at Matt for trying to grab her leg and pretend that something got her. But it was just Matt trying to lighten the mood. Boy, Luke said, that island, we've been swimming for about three hours now. That island doesn't seem to get any closer. Are you sure it's actually just 10, 10, 5, 10 miles? It's like, I, did, I, I thought it was. They didn't know is there another fight in the current. They're fighting, oh, no. they're fighting the tide going back and forth and the and what that life uh, sorry that lighthouse that they thought was just straight ahead of them was actually more of the northwest so that current is pushing them sideways mm -hmm. the whole time so what ended up happening is they're actually fighting this current the whole time as it pushes them back and forth oh no this is when a dark foreboding really set into the crew we're going to be out here at night Susie was apoplectic, just absolutely ballistic, not even being able to like talk coherently. Matt was trying to calm her down the whole time. Luke was was mad, frustrated at what, what happened. He shouldn't have been drinking so much last night. He shouldn't have like, forgone his responsibilities. Kate was the calm one of the group, really trying to settle all of them down. We got this, guys. We can do this. Let's just stay together and let's keep going. That night, it was... Very uneventful. The sea was calm, clean, no issues. And actually, there was plankton in the water, which really freaked them out at first because as you push into it, it actually glows. Mm. So as they were swimming, every hand push into the water, every kick of their fingers, every, every kick of their toes, it would actually push the water bright green. And it was so assuring. It was so beautiful comparing that to the night sky. It almost makes, it's almost like the opposite of what was going to happen. Morning broke on the second day. They could see that the island was a lot closer now. God, that's only about halfway. We got this, guys. It's so close. That's when they saw something. Some black shape in the water. They freaked out at first. Oh, it's, that's not good. What is that? 
Luckily, Luke, being what he was, he did bring some goggles with him. He went down, looked at in the water. Guys, it's okay. It's just some dolphins. The dolphins porpoise right next to them. No problem. They played with him a little bit, and it really actually brought up their spirits. Even Matt made a joke at Kate. Yeah, you thought that was a shark, didn't you? And then Kate punched him. They continued on to about midday when they all got a little bit tired. Kate, seeing the island there, said, hey guys, it's okay, we got this. It's only Now we're only about five miles away. Susie was a little tired, and so she started to hide back from the group, just trying to take a nap, which was fine because they had a lead line, and so they would take turns doing this, of course. As they were paddling, all of a sudden, Luke had this weird feeling that something wasn't right. Then out of nowhere, there was a huge commotion, an explosion, if you will, of water in between them. All of a sudden, they thought it was a dolphin. It was big, though, too big to be a dolphin. But what it was, was a 16-foot great white uh -oh. that just circled them. Luke looked down in the water to confirm what it was, and his face went white. He yelled to Matt and Kate, get next to me, back it up. And at that same moment, Luke was also thinking like, oh God, Susie. And as soon as those words slipped from his mouth, Matt's face went white too. And as they, they grabbed the rope from Kate and they start pulling her close, yelling, Susie, Susie, wake up, wake up, shark, shark, shark. They grab the line, pulling as hard as they can. Susie in a panic starts swimming towards them as fast as possible. But it was too late. All of a sudden she was grabbed from behind, brought underneath the water. She popped up in front of them, being drugged through the water like she was being pulled by a cable before she was just released. They get up to her and they realize that one of her legs are gone. Mm. She screams out in absolute terror and agony as this red pool just starts to form around her. As she starts to scream for the group, as Matt races towards her, Luke holds Kate back as tears well up in her eyes. All of a sudden, she drops underneath the surface, never to be seen. <clears throat> Matt, shocked, frustrated, swims back to Luke and starts punching him, beating him. This is all your fault. Why the fuck did you drink so much last night and not pay attention to where the fuck we were going? So that is their words, not mine. Kate breaks them up. Listen, guys, guys, we can't fight right now, okay? We gotta keep going. We gotta fucking keep going. They start swimming to shore, not fully processing what just happened. But then they realize another terrible thing, that the currents start moving again. Oh. Now it's pulling to low tide. Oh, no. Low tide means they'll be pulling back out to sea. They swim as hard as they can, but then they're actually in luck here because... It is actually getting shallower and they actually get to a little, little piece of land, which is a reef. This reef is not shallow enough though, that you're in high dry land. It is roughly ankle deep, maybe knee deep water. And they decide that this is where they're gonna have to spend their next night uh -oh. up on this little piece of reef. All three of them took the rope that was attached to Kate. Kate was, or Susie, I'm sorry. Kate examines the rope, trembling, because you can see where the line was cut. And they decide to tie themselves, all three around, and then tying it to the reef itself. That way they would stay in position and not drift in case they all three fell asleep and, and decided to take turns. Like coral or something? Yeah. Oh. Luke was apologetic, saying he was sorry for everything that happened. Matt wouldn't talk to him anymore. Kate really had to be the spirit of the group. That last, that night, no one really slept thinking about what happened to poor Susie. Obviously. Morning broke. We're now at day three. The tide started to slowly come back in. But they didn't see anything. No shark in the water. What do we do? Do we just stay on this reef? Luke's like, no, we got to make it to that island now. We're dead if we stay here. The group is terrified about that, about the decision of going back out into that water. Luke does still have the goggles. And he said, like, guys, listen, this is what I'll do. I'll be in the front, but I'll keep the goggles on. 
and I'll let you guys know if something bad happens or if there's a shark there. We'll get tight together and we'll be able to fend it off. We got this. Matt and Kate agree. All three decide to venture off this little piece of coral into the deeper water. Halfway through the day, they saw nothing, no issues. They even started to relax a little bit that maybe it, maybe it's over. Island was only three miles away now. And we were approaching slack tide. Slack tide, for you people that don't know, is when the tide doesn't move at all. You people. And so they were all in high spirits that maybe they could make it this final bit of the way. Matt's legs started to cramp a little bit, though, and they decided we needed to actually slow down our pace a little bit. We're not going to make it. Luke 100% agreed with this. We're going to push too hard right now, guys. If we push too hard, we could we could die of just of exhaustion there. As they all laid on their backs, thinking about what had happened, Luke got this really eerie feeling in the back of his head. Oh, like, again. Like a tickle. And that's when he looked down at the split second it came back. He was lucky enough though, though, because he was able to see it just at the last moment as it just did a brush by. It pushed the group, spearing right into all three of them, but not hitting any of them, but just coming in for a look. That's when Luke popped up, told everyone like, it's back, it's back. Matt and Kate were terrified, shocked. What do we do? What do we do? Everyone back to back, back to back right now. It came across and breached. Breach is the wrong word, but it's been broke the surface and circled them once, twice, three times. Kate cried out, just get it over with. What the fuck are you doing? And the third pass, it dropped underneath the water. Then all of a sudden, Matt was shot right under the group, pulled under. Matt surfaced. 30 feet away from the group, screaming, the fuckers got my leg. The fucker got my leg. Kate and Luke swim over to him frantically. They get to Luke. They take the rope and they tighten a tourniquet around his severed leg. That's hemorrhaging blood. Matt grabs Luke by the back of the head, stares straight into his eyes and says, get the fuck out of here. Get Kate out of here. I'm dead. I'm going to swim the opposite direction. Get out of here. Kate, with tears in her eyes, says, no, I'm not going to leave you. Luke grabs Kate and drags her away as Matt paddles the other way. And as they pass over the horizon, they hear one last massive blood curdling scream before silence. Luke now dragging Kate as she sobs. They paddle and paddle, but the tide just shifted. And now it's going back to low. And at this moment, they stop again on the next piece of the reef. They get to the last piece of the reef where they sit there. But this is lucky for them because this piece is almost out of the water. So they feel a comfort almost, a sobbing comfort. Luke trying to piece together everything that happened. Kate is pretty much in shock. Then they have an options here. Do we actually swim right now? It's low tide, but it's getting dark out. More out. But they decide to actually spend the night one last time in the ocean to regain their strength for the last push. Daybreak. Day four. Luke. Kate. Kate still holding on to the ring that Matt gave her just so many days before when life seemed so perfect, contemplating everything that happened. Luke, with everything that has happened to all of them, he looks now and sees that it's right there. The lighthouse, everything's right there. We can make it. It's not even half a mile. Maybe the size of two football fields, honestly. After everything we've been through, how we can get to this part. It's mostly just the reef. And then there's a channel. But after we get to the channel, we're there. I'll go first. I have the goggles still. We are going to survive. They start their way through there. No issues. Then all of a sudden, Luke jumps up in absolute fear. Nah! 
Kate, what? What is it? What is it? And he says it's a stonefish. Don't step on it. It's poisonous. Kate punches him hard in, in the side. Almost a little bit of levity after what everything has happened. But then Luke stops for a minute with a deep breath. Okay, we're at the edge of this reef. And the tide's coming in. We're going to have to swim across the channel. But then the lighthouse is right there. They can see it. It's right there. No more than a football field away now. And the way I say that now, I can say it in the distance that it is not very far. But these two survivors, it feels like an eternity, again, over open water. They make the swim and they make the plunge as they go in. They're no longer paddling in a concerted effort. It's more primal than that. For at this moment, it is truly to survive. As they paddle as fast and as hard as they can, Luke, still being the, the stronger of the two, was out in the front paddling with the goggles on, going as fast and hard as they can. They were getting, they were about 100 yards away. I think that's about right when Luke said he saw it. It came back. But this time it was underneath, deep. I could be more than 50 feet down, just shadowing us deep on the bottom. How is he still hungry? Is it a dolphin? No. No, that's not a dolphin, Luke said to himself. And he just stopped swimming. I saw him in front of me. And he just paused there like he was thinking for a while. Then he handed me the goggles. And he told me to keep swimming as fast as I could. He gave the goggles to Kate? I started to swim as fast as I could. As Luke just sat there splashing as hard as possible. I, I didn't know what he was doing. Then all of a sudden, I heard him scream and then he was gone. And then I realized he was just buying me time. I was able to get to the, the lighthouse. And then within another two days, a crew came by. And they were able to actually rescue me. So Kate's the only one that survived. And after everything that I went through, after losing my best friend and my fiance, all I have is a ring and some scars to remember this by. And that was the tale of the reef. So, um, what movie was made after this? So we will, I will link that in the episode description. Um, it's what'd you guys think about it? <laughs> That's a great question, Caroline. How did they get a bite radius if all they had left over were lungs? Absolutely. So Caroline, they didn't get a bat. They didn't get a real bite radius off of them. It was just basically what Ryan's testimony was. So you're hundred percent correct. They did not get a true bite radius. It was basically the, the account of the person that was there. So could it be a smaller shark? Absolutely. And honestly, I'm pretty sure the guy, I mean, I, exaggeration is the wrong word because it's like, it still killed him. He so overestimated the size due to the shock, maybe. I mean, yeah, but it's just like, I, I don't want to belittle it. Like, it's probably not as big as you thought. It's like, yeah, it still killed the guy. So it's like, it was big enough. Drug him underwater. Yeah. It's just yeah. It's like, well, how big was the cougar that killed your child? Like, it wasn't that big. It's like, so what are you saying? Like Timmy's a pussy. Cause he like got eaten by like, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Like, so yeah, I, I agree. So scientifically they, they don't have measurements of what they were. They are assuming because in post they used drones and helicopters to fly over the area to look, they saw a shark that they thought was about 17 plus feet long, which I believe is about five meters. Mm -hmm. Um, in the area they only had yeah so about usually in australia they go based on meters there i wouldn't know anyway so yeah um that was the story of the reef uh a fantastic movie by the way it's very scary uh it is actually based on a true story we're gonna watch it now I've never and seen so it. i'm actually gonna bring that up very exciting. So this is what it's actually based on the story. It is a little bit. Um, and like I said, like they adjusted some things on it. Oh, so basically in this story, in the in the true thing that happened. Townsville. Australia. It was basically there were three people that are out in Australia. The skipper, Ray, Ray Bondi, who was 28. And I know you guys can see this here. They were out off the Coral Sea in Australia when their boat capsized. And there were four of them. 
I'm sorry, there were three of them. Yeah. When they were hunted by a tiger shark. And for uh -huh. the story, they did shift it to a great white. Okay. But in okay. the same thing, what happened was one of the individuals, when the shark appeared, it took one of the individuals. And this is actually pretty creepy. Hopefully, they actually have it here in this one. Uh, right here. There we go. About 10 minutes. All right. There we go. There we go. What? So basically, after they were actually, so they clung to wreckage, which included a surfboard, a life ring, and a piece of styrofoam shrimp box as the trawler sank. Okay, Bondi said the shark approached Monday night. We weren't talking much. Notice of him thinking that if we didn't antagonize him, uh, he might leave us alone, Bondi said. He took a bite out of my leg under the surfboard, so I kicked him with my foot and he let go. About 10 minutes later, the, sh the shark struck. He's got my leg. The bastard's got my leg. I love how they actually kept, I, it's a little dark, but I like how they kept that line in the story mm -hmm. and also like in real life. Mm -hmm. Bondi quoted Murphy as, uh, Bondi quoted Murphy as screaming. So basically, Murphy. Somebody's talking about so Murphy Bondi, screaming. Murphy, and this one other person that she'll come into the story later, screaming, you're joking, I said. But then I could see the blood coming to the surface through the water. I didn't know what to do. We'd been hanging together so well for so long pushed ourselves so hard. I just didn't know how to deal with it because we had no dinghy. We had nothing to use as a tourniquet. Even if we stopped the bleeding, the shark was still going to come back. And it just, I didn't know what to do. The shark came back and I said to, I, I said to Murphy, what do you want to do? And he said, you bolt, gather in all the stuff, leave me. And he swam off about four or five paces. Bonnie said in an emotionally choked voice. Everything seemed to be going all right for a couple of hours. I got Lenny to get her spirits back up, and we seemed to be traveling along all right, and I knew we'd get to the reef sometime in the morning. About 4 a.m., the shark struck again. Lindy was sitting in the sling with the life buoy when I saw him come along again. I was pretty sure he was the same shark this time. He came along as slow as you like beside me, then slewed around and grabbed Lindy around the arm and the chest. I was still holding her by the hand as he shook her, and about three or four times, she only let out one little squeak as soon as it hit, and I knew almost instantly that she was dead. Oof. So the shark took two of the three, and the other one made it to the reef. Wow. But that's what it was based on. That's insane. I and, can't believe the yacht didn't have like a dinghy or something to like float on to get to the island. Wait, mom, did you say Wehrmacht? I don't know what she's saying. What, mom? Is that Wehr German Wehrmacht? What are you talking about? Ve Wart Wehrmacht presented. I think she said very well presented, but I don't know what happened. I have no idea what happened there. So anyway, that was the tale of the reef. Uh, I thought that was very interesting because of how, honestly, I'm not going to be lying to you guys, how dark that was. Mm -hmm. And then it, I love with that is you have a very good testimony of what happened by the people. Mm -hmm. And then you have a story, which, of course, they they, they added more people and all that stuff. But then it's like you read the fake one. And then you realize what actually happened. Like, oh, shit, that's actually pretty lined up. They kept a lot of the um, the lines. And, like, it's the, scary. The horror behind it, yeah. And I the mean. reef itself. Like, they were swimming towards a reef to get to safety. Um, That is just creepy. And the fact is, like, could it be more than one shark? Whatever. Yeah. But the point is, like, that is a very terrifying thing that actually happened. And it's also this little fear in the back of our heads I think we all have about open water, yeah. which is kind of terrifying. And that leads us to maybe more of a lighthearted thing. Um. I, I thought this was, I thought this was kind of funny. Uh, it's it's sad for this guy, but it's it's kind of funny. Sad for this guy. Yep. All right. So we are going to get into a story okay, that doesn't story. make sense. Okay. Until you actually hear this, you wouldn't make sense. This is an individual who is either the luckiest man in the world, or the or just the most unluckiest man. His name is John Dylan, and he is one of the few people who can attest that he got attacked by a shark and a lion in the same day. So I'm going to bring this sucker up because I found his file in the shark attack files. So I, I kid you not, this actually happened. This is a thing. It was documented. So I'll bring it up here. here we go. Do you want 
Mm -hmm. Who, who's reading it? Oh, if you, I mean, it's just, it's just the, not the obituary, but it's just basically <laughs> his, uh, he, it's he, not the obituary. He lived, what he is lived. it? Well, okay. obviously it's not then. So what is his last name? Doyle. So John Doyle was surfing alone. And when he spotted some shark fins thrashing the water about 20 meters away, he decided it was time to get out of the sea. Noticing a, a set, which is basically some waves, he paddled towards the thrashing water in order to get into position to catch a wave so he could ride it in. He was stoking into the wave when he saw the shark's fin streaking directly towards him. He leapt to his feet and was onto the wave that should have taken him away to safety. Unfortunately, Doyle caught a rail coming out of the bottom turn and went into the water. He felt a sharp pain as a shark grabbed his calf. Reaching down, he smacked the shark in the snout and it released its grip. Doyle remounted his board and positioned himself for the next wave. As he was wallowing in the foamy white water, the shark came at him again, this time from the side. Doyle rolled off his board, pushed it into the shark's mouth, and the shark bit his board in two. Oof. Doyle grabbed the rear half of the board and used it to ride the next set of waves inshore. These are the injuries. But this is, this is where it gets even better. Unable to walk, Doyle crawled up the beach and, ass and assessed the injury to his leg. After stumbling to his vehicle, the 1973 Land Rover, I think they meant Rover, but four-wheeler, he wrapped his leg in clothing and proceeded towards the nearest community one hour away. This is a very remote beach Jeez, in Africa. Pete. This is Africa, by the way. You can get lions, so yeah. yeah. Uh, to seek medical care. In the blistering heat, he became dehydrated and stopped at a creek for drinking water and a brief rest. He was lying down on a rock at the water's edge when a male lion attacked him, biting his torso. <laughs> Doyle was able to chase the lion away with a stick. He was halfway to his vehicle when a pride of lionesses <laughs> intercepted him and he received additional lacerations on his arms and legs before he reached the safety of his vehicle. Unable to drive, he sat in the vehicle, basically while bleeding to death, while the pride, the pride of lions battered, battered in an attempt to get at him. Oh, my God. 30 minutes later, passing tourists found him and brought him into the medical clinic. The doctors confirmed, this is the treatment, doctors confirmed Doyle's saturated lacerations on many parts of his body from lions and a great white shark. That's what a white shark is. And a 250 sutures, 250 sutures were needed to repair his wounds. The surfer made a complete recovery and now resides in California with his wife, Janice, the species involved. Uh, I love how they just like a three minute great white, which is, which is a really small the species involved. And by the way, so Carcaridon carcarius, uh, that is a great white. That's the Latin name for, for great white. How shark. did you read that so easily? Because you I didn't read the word sustained appropriately. God damn, this woman is so hard on me. Wait, what? I'm have... just saying that's incredible. I can read I'm Latin. Right, I'm looking at those words going, what the hell? And he's I, like, it's car. Da, 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 da. Like, I know Latin. Oh, man. Bilingual. Who the no, hell? I'm not. Like, no, Woo it's just like medical terminology I'm good with because like everything in everything, a lot of medical terminologies are either Greek or Latin. Uh huh. And then, of course, like animal names. Very impressive, Tom. It's not impressive. I'm giving, I'm giving you a it's compliment. It's from Carcaridon Carcaris. Guys, in the chat, let me know. Like, everyone knows Carcaridon Carcaris because, like, it's said on Shark Week every year for, like, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this right here is, like, part of the Shark Attack file. This is Shark Attack file stuff. I can link this in the episode description as well. It gives you, like, the air temperature, everything. It gives you the location this happened. I just thought this this guy was either the most... Okay, and it's uh, Angola, West Africa, by the way. I love how it says remote. <laughs> remote location. So... I don't know. Let me know in the description. Is he the luckiest guy or the most unluckiest guy ever? Oh man, that's that's a that's a toss up right there. Luckiest guy to be alive to get attacked by two beasties in one day. Let's hey, be honest. Lucky. Unlucky to be t attacked by two beasties in one day. So toss up a coin. John lay helplessly as the shark came at him. Like I just love that. But then okay, let's get. Oh, we get some more details here. I like this. Confirm like okay, we actually read all that stuff. Cool. Yeah, yeah we got it all. That's, that's so nuts. funny. That's a crazy I, I story. Know, when, just, when was this again? What, when did this, this happen? This happened. That's actually a very good point. The incident occurred in the fall of 1993. <gasps> the fall before I was born. Yep, he lived. In case anyone wanted to know. <laughs> that is a bad day. It is a bad day. I just thought that was a... I was just, the what worst are the odds? Day. What are the odds that you make it to shore and you're like, ah, I'm fine. And you get to drink and then you get hit by a lion. 
And then you like drag yourself back to the car. Like I'm fine. Then a pride of lioness has come. And then you're like, you know what? I'm just going to bleed to death in the car. Right. I feel Basically, like that's better. Like, well, I think I don't know the options. That's better. I give up. God and really wants to be dead. This is the question of the day for everyone that's listening. Would you rather? Oh. Would you rather have to be like those poor people in our in our first story, the reef, and be floating in the water, or being attacked by a pride of lions? Again, I would always go with land. Really? Yes. There's more chance of survival if you if you have land. I don't know why. You can run. You can climb some trees. <clears throat> you have sticks and things to yeah. bash them with. Weapons are all around you in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. A rock. A stone, a, a stick, whatever stone, your shoe, stick, yeah. your shoe, your shoe. That's true. Whatever, like you have some kind of form. <laughs> I think this guy. I think it's funny because I bet I. I just love. I'm sorry. Like this story is so funny because I picture this guy like on the couch watching Shark Week, and, and you have this scientist like the chances of you getting hit by a shark or whatever. And he's just there like that's some bullshit right there. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know why that just makes me so Do funny. not agree. Every time people say like, oh, you know, well, the chance of getting hit by lightning or the winning the lottery. It's like, motherfucker, like this is who I am. Like, I mean, I'm sorry. Like if you're that person, you can never come. You first, you have an amazing story. But the second I like, you can't listen to people complaining. No. Your wife or your friend complaining like, I got fired at work. I got I got attacked by a goddamn shark in a line the same day. It's like, all right, fine. You're that dude. You're, we don't. Yeah. If nobody can beat John Doyle's stories, he's not Schmidt. Who is he? If he's new girl, new girl. What character is he? I don't know. Who's just like he's Nick. him. Yeah, he's Nick. Nick. He's Nick. He's not Schmidt. No, no. Poor Nick. All the bad things. Yeah, poor Nick. Nick. Yes, poor Nick. That That's a Nick story right there. Yeah. Anyway, guys, uh, because I know I'm going to get absolute hate about this whole story when I actually post it to YouTube. Right. With this a title. This is not our normal spiritual uh, story. Well, not just that, because I'm going to have the whole comment yeah, section yeah. being like, sharks are basically perfect. And they never hurt people. I am. Shark attacks are very rare. They don't really happen that often. I don't think you need to explain yourself. I'm just, just covering my bases. Shark attacks are rare. Mistaking identity does happen. Territorial attacks do happen. Example, this one story I didn't go over today was in California where a couple was in a dual kayak and the kayak was broken in half Ooh. by a great white shark that, that hit it. Both people were perfectly fine. They didn't get hurt. That was a case more of a predator, not predatorial Lucky. attack, but a, of a territorial attack, I think, where the shark was just pushing the kayak out of its territory. Ah. That does happen, especially with like paddle boarders and kayakers for some reason. Uh, there's also this story of a boy being attacked on top of a boat, the shark jumped into the boat to grab him. Oh, I've heard of that one. That one was a really cool one. So anyway, my point is, so they're very rare. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, please don't be stupid and like go swimming at night, going under a pier because they're still predators. Like they're still alpha predators. And if you're left in the water, this really cool guy, I really like him on YouTube. He's, he's an outdoors guy here. He owns a charter company. He's a spear fisherman. And he said this really cool thing. Oh, I got a cool comment here. Wait. I mean, how does a shark know if he likes to eat humans if he doesn't take a bite? And that's so this spirit, this this really cool guy, Carol Ann, and I'll link him in the episode description too. And he does a lot of spear fishing. He said, if you're in the water with a shark, it's no different than if you're in the savannah with a lion or in the jungle with a tiger. It has two thoughts. Do I fear you or can I eat you? Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all they have. And those are the two options. And so when you're in the water, you have to make them fear you. Because there's only other one other option. Right. Because that's what that's what any animal does. It's a predator. Yeah. It sizes you up, whether it's a crocodile, tiger, or lion, is are you food or should I be afraid of you? Right. And that's all it is. And I think I think we almost, and as Steve Rowan really said, you know, like they're alpha predators. You don't have to make excuses for them. You know, it's like, and I I just love that quote. Like, yeah, it's like it's an alpha predator. We don't have to be like, oh, it mistaken you. It's like, no, it's a crocodile. Like, who cares? It's a damn crocodile. Like it's a lion. It's a shark. Like, just respect it. It doesn't mean we need to kill him. And I think that also gets into this here, which is the last thing I'm going to leave the night with. This is the last thing I'm going to leave the night with because I thought this was interesting. This is the shark attack files. Ooh. These are the percent shark attacks that have happened. Move this up there. She's it. There we go. Cool. So red is provoked. Other, I don't know what other means. And then you got unprovoked from 1970s. Carly, when did Jaws come out? 
the 1970s. Late 1970s. You see they had that dip there? Oh, I'm good. And so one of those things that happened with that dip is you had also had massive poaching of the sharks. You oh. had massive killings. Oh. You also had people afraid to go in the water. But then you start seeing in the 90s. Can you zoom in? I can't tell when the 90s are. The 90s are right here. And I'll, I'm okay. going to post this if I can online too. Actually, Carly will post it on our Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Uh, Carly, uh, Carly might like this. Anyway. So you start seeing a huge jump really right in the 90s is when you start seeing this, this parabolic jump in shark attacks. Mm -hmm. And so there are a couple of theories out there. One, there's not as many fish in the ocean. There's a huge dampering on their prey items. That's causing an issue. Two, there's more people in the water. Like, oh. of course, right? Yeah. Like COVID uh, in 2020 yeah. was a huge spike in shark attacks. Okay. Probably because there's, there's more people, people in the water. Right. Absolutely. You know, those are really the two prominent theories. There's another one that I think people don't think about. There are two. There's more sharks because great white sharks, for example, have been protected since the 80s. Ah. Okay. Uh, or for example, and then something else happened in around the 90s too. Shark Week started. Ah. Shark Week started and has been on this very good campaign of convincing people that about the sharks and we having to protect them. Mm -hmm. And it's made a very good conservational effort. And the reason I know that this probably is the reason is there was also an introduction of wolves back into Yellowstone Park. This idea that we have to conserve these predators before wolves were hunted extremely bad uh, in Western America, especially in like Montana, places where you have ranchers and stuff. But then yeah. they started to actually protect them. But then they had an issue where they actually would grow in abundance. Um, now, again, it's very hard to actually gauge these type of creatures in the ocean. And I know this because of David Sikorsky, who is actually the, not to toot my own horn, but with the uh, fishing of the MV, actually had David Sikorsky, who actually runs Chesapeake Bay Foundation. He actually, actually worked on some of the projects with tuna, which I talked to Carly about the other night. Tuna are, and as everyone knows, it's a big time sushi fish, but it's also a big fish for the international community so there's actually an international task force that actually tags and monitors bluefin blackfin tuna from the mediterranean all the way to the atlantic coast and they even say it's very hard even if you throw money at it, to know how many fish are there so mm -hmm. it is all anecdotal i do i agree with that okay i will conclude though i think around america specific species of sharks that do adapt well the bull shark the great white which is protected by the way there are more cases of people seeing them than ever before. Does that mean there's more? Or are we just seeing them more? I don't know. Our Maybe we're able to identify them better. Our sea lions coming back. We're more, they more, are more well versed. I think we're more well versed. I think there's also more sea lions now because they're protected. Mm -hmm. Maine now has better uh, sea lion populations than ever before. Great white shark came back. That's got to mean something. True. And anyway, so my whole point for this graph is not to say that it's one thing. I know that you guys were looking for me to have a smoking gun. I think it's everything. I think it's the fact that I think there might be less fish in the sea. I think that there are more sharks of specific species. I think there are more people in the ocean. But I also have my last theory. I think it's people being stupid. <laughs> and I, I don't, I, I honestly mean this. I think people, because of Shark Week, and I think this is almost like when you go over the top, when you constantly tell people after every shark attack or everything on Shark Week where you have no chance of getting hit because it's one in a thousand, and you do that for three years, I think you start convincing people that they can that do stupid never things. Get yeah, and it comes because people don't understand statistics. Right. You never get hit by lightning. Yeah, if you never go outside, it's a very small risk. Sharks may also be moving into new territory due to global warming. Oh, 100 percent That's a, that's another great statistic there. Like I yeah, I'm just I'm sorry. That's another great um hypothesis. I think that was also to do with the two. Mm -hmm. Um I just think it's like I don't want I, I really get sick of being a guy that's always out in the water and you see these predators and you have people saying like well Shark Week said they don't like to eat people. It's like that's literally they made a joke about this gaff again about the bears coming up with the rules like just play dead so we can eat you faster it's like oh the bears think we should go like play dead like stop making excuses for alpha predators be like we shouldn't kill them because they're important but that doesn't mean you just float in the ocean and be like oh yeah there's no chance these things are going to hurt you right you know what i mean so i don't know i just think that's just weird where people make have a healthy respect for them yeah have a healthy respect for them. what you've been preaching this entire episode. and also that we might have to actually do another call at some point um you know, last year, uh, Maine had its first fatal shark attack where a great white almost beached itself to grab this girl and Oof. took her 
because yeah, like, and that was the thing. So they're like, oh, we shouldn't swim in Maine. I could do a whole story on that. And they're like, well, you know, it's just one in a million. It's like, but when does one in a million become like too many? You know, and that's an issue with like the wolves in Canada too, in certain pieces where there's like too many timber wolves now because mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. And, and then this is also ties in. They're thinking about introducing mountain lions in Pennsylvania because they used to be here. I, it's just, sorry. Last rant. Does right. no one not think that's a stupid idea to be like, you know what? It's just, I think suburban like PA where, you, where your family lives, uh, the PT guy. And just like, we should just like have cougars now there. Like how many dogs, and little kids need to get eaten before you're like, Oh, you know, this was a bad idea. Middleburg has cougars now, by the way, too. They saw two mountain lions there. So it's just, I don't know. It's just, anyway, anyway, guys, that was this episode. I can go on for it. Uh, I hope you liked it. Uh, I know I'm going to get hate for it. I'm not saying kill all sharks, just respect them. They are scary, but they're also really cool creatures. And next week, we are going to get back to our roots. It's going to be another ghost story. We have a bunch of spooky ghost stories all lined up to get us ready for the holiday season. And then it'll be the best time of year because we're going to be hyping the shit out of some haunted houses, some corn mazes, and we're going to do a pumpkin carving thing for our channel because we didn't do that last year. I really want to do a pumpkin carving thing where I just record her making shit on pumpkins. And we're gonna do a vampire store and where and I'm so excited. It's gonna be Halloween season. Costumes galore. Yeah. We're gonna oh, we Costumes didn't tell you this. Galore. By the way, we're gonna clip this. Like every single week during the month of October. Yes, we're gonna clip so this excited. uh for Instagram. But this year, I, I'm thinking at least October ish. Can we're you gonna share the whole screen or oh sorry. At, this at, year, what's happening? I'm sorry, we're gonna clip this because I'm I'm gonna edit shit down. But Last year, Carl and I absolutely loved the one episode we got to dress up. So we're going to do that more. I don't know if it's going to be like for all of October, but it's just, it's going to be more than one episode because that was a lot of fun. Because then it gives us excuses to buy a couple different costumes and then just play dress up. Oh, I'm saying every single week for the entire month of October. More costumes, more decorations on our mural. Come on. Yep. We're going to pimp it out. So anyway. We're going back to ghost stories. We got a bunch of ghost stories lined up. Thank you for indulging my whole shark scary like fetish thing, whatever you call it. You made us weak. Yep. And we'll see you guys next time on Spirits and Ghost Stories. Bye.